subscribe to our youtube channel press the bell icon and stay entertained tracking milestones of an incredible journey spanning 30 years rehman music sheets slum dog millionaire its world premiere was held on 30th august 2008 at the Telluride Film Festival Colorado USA a week later it was screened at the Toronto International Film Festival Canada whispers grew into words and transformed into screams cheering the film and now we celebrate 14 years of slum dog millionaire even though it was written by a british guy and produced by a british guy and, and directed by me We decided to make it in a diff very different way. I get this call email from Danny Boy. So they would be interested. It'll be an honor to you know work with you. Drop all your prejudices about what you think about slums and stuff like that. Just forget all that. Just look at this life force here. Great music makes a film feel half its length and twice as clear. It never even occurred to me that the impact of this music could be so much when watching the movie. Based on a novel by Indian author and a diplomat Vikas Swaroop, the 2008 critically acclaimed Slumdog Millionaire announced the arrival of A R Rahman in global cinema. To the east, he was already a tune smith of highest caliber, but to the west, Rahman was fairly a new name. Yet, the fact remains, his earlier international collaborations always stood out especially to those who mattered. I remembered something that I'd forgotten, which is that I remember seeing a Spike Lee movie called Inside Man, and it was a very similar idea in it to a movie I'd made called Millions, which is about a kind of robbery when a guy's left inside. Anyway, I watched the movie, really enjoyed it. I love Spike Lee's movies, and I stayed for the credits because there was some good music playing, and then there was some amazing music playing. I thought, what the, what's that? What's that? And I looked it up as soon as I got home, got on the internet, looked it up. It was Chaya Chaya from Dulce, which I kind of knew in the way that kind of great music, great musicians, you sort of know them. You're just waiting to discover them. They're in your baggage. You just can't, haven't quite located them yet. You're carrying A R Rahman and Rome, whether you like it or not, and he's in there in you. You know, you just got to find him when it's right, when it's the right time. It's like Mozart. You know, like Mozart, who he's compared to, and you know, all the great composers. They're in there. You just don't realize that. You think I'm not interested in Beethoven or Shostakovich. Or, they're all in there, and you'll find them at some point. You know, when you're right for it. You know. So when we came to make Slumdog, it was um, then there was the question: is who was going to do the music? And I have to give credit to the guys that we were working with, who kept saying to me all the time. <laughs> You've got to use Rahman. You got to use Alaraka Rahman. And I was like, and and I and I kind of knew his stuff. And it, they say you got to meet him. It's very difficult to describe. Obviously, it's one of the themes of Slumdog Millionaire that everything is sort of fated, really. And they knew I was going to end up using AR Rahman. After Lagan, Swades, and Joda Akbar, Ashutosh Gowarikar and Rahman were getting ready for their fourth film together. What's your Rashi? That's when fate intervened. Danny Boyle called Rahman. I guess it's it's destiny. <laughs> uh, no, no one can plan. I was I was in um, in a state where again I was doing a lot of movies, and I get this call email from Danny Boyle. So they would be interested. It'll be an honor to you know work with you and all this stuff. So when I I heard about Train Spotting and I saw the movie. and uh, realized this potential with soundtracks is am- amazing year for soundtracks and that excited me a lot so like if you so right about soundtracks i mean to work with them you, you can learn a lot of things which you don't know in this sensibilities so i had to leave ashutosh i speak to ashutosh and said i i can't do your movie i want to do this movie if because he was shooting in a very similar time frame so that happened and then um he had already shot the movie by then by the, in the in the three months of communication he already finished shooting and we kept missing opportunities of meeting you know every time would fix some time i would be busy or he would be busy and when it was almost impossible one day i text him or he text me saying that let's meet i am in this hotel and he said i am in the same hotel another floor Anyway, I met him. We had a lovely meeting. He's very quiet, doesn't talk a lot. He's a musician, you know, he talks through his music. 
So we met for breakfast when he just gave the DVD. He said, see this. And again, I had it in my hand for a week. I didn't see it. And one night I was restless and I was watching this. And I was amazed by what potential it had. And, uh, and then three weeks, four weeks, we just went like a machine uh, doing crazy things and sending it to him. And he would say, I like this, I like that. And we got on very well, and then we started work. And, and, and when we came, we edited the film here, and um, he was wonderful because he worked, mul for most of the movie, he worked in, he had a little studio in Tufnell Park in London. And this was before he built the studio. He's built a big studio in LA, which I haven't seen yet. He keeps inviting me to, but I'm never there, so. Um, and we worked, but we worked in Tufnell Park. And I would work in the, I would work in the editing room during the day. And then, I'd, like, about 8 o'clock at night, I'd go up to his place. And he's just, he's, he's like all musicians are the same. They don't really start working until the sun's gone down, you know? <laughs> and then they begin to work. And it's exhausting because they work through the middle of the night. So we'd be sat there, and they'd have all these people turning up from the West End. So all these people who are in Lion King, all these musicians, singers, performers, who in, they'd all turn up for him at 11 o'clock at night when the show would come down. And I'm, like, exhausted, like, and we just, you know, he's just getting going, he's just getting started. You could probably cut that, you can cut the note if you want. Sure. Turn on. It's almost everything in slow motion. Okay. Phantom. So, um... It was a wonderful experience, actually. And so we'd talk about stuff and then... Put, we didn't really talk that much, really. You can't really talk about music. It just doesn't... It's not really one to talk about. They always say talking about music is like dancing about architecture. It doesn't make any sense, really. And so you kind of, like, just play stuff. And then we played stuff and... And I would bring him stuff, you know, stuff that... Because I lay up music, temporary music, for the movie, and I would bring him stuff and he would see how I'd used it. And then he'd go off and then I'd go back and the next night or a couple of nights later, and he'd done amazing stuff with it, just... And his, his score for the whole movie... I mean, obviously, the Jai Hall gets all the attention, you know, and rightly so, but his score for the, for the film is phenomenal, I think. And it's a very diverse film, you know, it's very vig vignette -y. there's three sets of characters, they're the same people but at three different ages, and it's all over the place really, and it's his music that binds it all together, you know, and that pulls you into it, and also makes you feel India, because, he, you know, but he also, he, what he did brilliantly is he made it feel accessible to the West as well, you know, as well as being, as well as delivering um, India, he, he also, or Mumbai especially, he also made it accessible to Westerners who might find it baffling, you know. I mean, they gave him those Oscars because he's serious. They don't give out Oscars easily in the composition world. They, and that's why it tends to be all the same guys getting it all the time. They don't let newcomers in very easily. But I think they all knew that this was like, this wasn't just a one song film. This was seriously scored throughout. And the Oscar goes to A.R. Rahman for Slumdog Millionaire. Yeah, uh, did you ever expect Slumdog Millionaire to win Grammy, Oscars, and virtually every possible award? No. The, the thing about that movie was it had only 18 or 19 cues. Normally in a movie you would have like 153, 154 cues in so many reels. So it never even occurred to me that the impact of this music would be so much while watching the movie. But that's his genius. And the way he had put the music against the picture created a whole new feeling for people when they watched it. And that's his peculiar style which he still uses. And for me, we're lucky that it all happened. And it happened to be an Indian movie and it did a lot of things for me too. <laughs> Made on a shoestring budget of 50 million US dollars, Slumdog Millionaire collected around 400 million dollars at the box office. A British producer and British director chose to work with Indian cast and crew. One wonders if it had anything to do with the British Empire and its colonial past.
I'd made a film before in uh, South Asia, Southeast Asia, in Thailand, called The Beach, which was a huge movie with a big movie star in it, Leonardo DiCaprio. And we had traveled to Thailand with an enormous crew. And I never felt happy with how we were doing it. I, 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 I wasn't sharp enough to know what was wrong, but something was wrong. I wasn't sure what it was. And after I'd finished the film, a few years later, I realized that you can't make films in the modern era and behave like that, because it, it's basically colonial. It's just a repeat of a colonial exercise. A huge bunch of Westerners turn up in a jet aircraft with a load of money and just kind of take over. And of course, the Thai people were wonderful and they go, sure, yeah, we'll do whatever you say. And so there's 250 of you and you're making a film that's set in Thailand. It was slightly different, that film, because it was actually set amongst a bunch of Westerners who were using it as a paradise utopia escape from Western pressures, but still the principle was still there. So when we came to make Slumdog, even though it was written by a British guy and produced by a British guy and, and directed by me, we decided to make it in a diff very different way. And we decided to take no one, eight people, and, dis and make the film in Mumbai with local people, the whole cast, the crew, everybody, apart from us eight. And um, it, was, it bore much more fruit, and I realised what I'd done wrong with the beach, which is that you cannot, in the, in the modern world, you can't behave like that anymore. You've actually got to make, you can't turn up with a huge, huge crew and just kind of, because basically you're just ravaging a, a land for its pictures or its look or something, and you're not going to get near the spirit of it at all. <laughs> So, what's your favourite track in Slumdog Millionaire? I love the thing he did at the beginning, old Sire, with, with M.I.A. Because it was very important to start the film in a way that was, like, rampant. There was going to be no opportunity for people to um, back away from this film. You know, it was like, woof, straight at you. And so he did this. We had this whole sequence worked out about this running through the slum and just the energy of the place. You know, it was just kind of, it was just saying, saying, drop all your prejudices about what you think about slums and stuff like that. Just forget all that. Just look at this life force here. And he was wonderful working with MIA because she was obviously, she was a devotee of his, you know, growing up. You know, she, you know, she, she loved his, his work. And so... I remember sitting with them in the studio and they would be, they'd just be playing each other's stuff on their, on their computers, you know? They'd be like sending each other stuff and playing each other's stuff and then they came up and they just developed this tune together and then, you know, and her song, her singing on top of it. And, and I love that really. I mean, I, I love all the score actually. There's so much of it I love, really love. Great music makes a film feel half its length and twice as clear as it would be without it, you know, or with a different, a lesser score on it, really. That's their genius when, it, when they come up, when they pull it off and they repeat themes. So they make you feel like you've been, you're familiar with something. You, you kind of feel without, you're not consciously thinking about it, but unconsciously, you're subconsciously saying, I've heard this before, I'm familiar with it, I know this world. It belongs to me, you know, it's part of me. And it pulls you in, and it kind of like, anyway, and the, yeah, so he's a, you know, what can you say? Slumdog Millionaire was set to be released on DVD, yet it became a mega hit worldwide on the big screen. Jai Ho, the song was not even a part of the film, yet it became a global sensation. Did Danny Boyle expect this? For answers, Danny Boyle and A.R. Rahman will continue with us in the next episode. Mani Ratnam, Subhash Ghai and Shekhar Kapoor will also be there. Stay with us. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, press the bell icon and stay entertained.